What's your name? Where you from? Tell us how you got into all this. Okay, uh, my name is Perna Krishnamurthy. I go by my Detroit lawyer. I'm from Detroit. Um, how I got into all this, meaning law? Yes, law. <laughs> Went to law school. <laughs> <laughs> what made you want to go to? Um, honestly, it's like one of those cliche things where people are like, oh yeah, ever since I was a child, I wanted to go to law. It was one of those type of things. I just always wanted to be a lawyer. But you followed through though. Yeah, I followed through. Well, I was going to get into some other questions, but first, let's get into this case that you was on. It was uh, Michael Jackson Bolanos. <laughs> yes, let's get into that. Have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen a, a ex-boyfriend admit to it and then he don't get charged with nothing and still continue to? No. Uh, this is absolutely the most unprecedented thing I have ever heard of or seen in my entire life. Like, this guy completely admitted to, he confessed to murdering his girl. He was given immunity at trial, and they still attempted to prosecute uh, Michael Jackson Bolanos for this. Wild. How long was he incarcerated for? Fighting this? Uh, he's been there since December 10th. And people wonder why he just didn't get time served? Was he on parole or anything like that? No. Wow. No. He, um... <sighs> why didn't he get time served? He should have. The recommendation from probation, or from MDOC, was for probation, for time served. And, um... It was going to be three years probation and six months of an MDOC tether. The judge decided not to go with the recommendation from MDOC and decided to do her own thing. And that's how he's ending up going to prison. Do you find at times like the judge is more like on the prosecutor side? Yes. Yes. And the reason being is because most judges uh, are were prosecutors previously although this judge that is not actually what happened with her she was never a prosecutor before oh. nor was she a defense attorney she was just like uh my understanding from what i've heard that other people have researched she was like a real estate lawyer and then <laughs> or like business litigation and probate and stuff like that and then from there she was appointed to her position as judge for a criminal docket so I don't know. Some of you don't understand. Heading into the situation, though, you knew it was going to be a lot of publicity. Was you nervous? No. Did, did you think the first time it was just going to be some deadlock or you thought everybody was going to just vote like, hey, not guilty? Yeah, I thought for sure it was going to be not guilty. I mean, we did five weeks of trial. The The evidence was lacking. As much as like the, I know like the Wall family, they're like, oh, there was overwhelming evidence. I don't know what trial they were watching, but if they were watching the same one that I was participating in, then there was a lack of evidence. That was the overwhelming part. There was an overwhelming lack of evidence, so I'm not really sure what they're referring to. I don't know what trial they watched. I don't think that they watched the Michael Jackson Bolanos trial, though. I'm pretty sure that they were watching something else. I see you very, very passionate about it. You post about it, go online. I mean, not online, but live. Has it been bothering your personal life at all, knowing that he been through this misjustice yeah i mean yeah of course it bothers my professional life my personal life like for sure um knowing that these type of injustices exist in the world like that bothers me all the time i'm constantly thinking about stuff like that like that's uh that's crazy that's hard that's just like a i'm not one of those people that can just like forget about it like i can't i can't not take my work home like my work is always going to come home with me that's just the type of person i am right uh, anything else you want to say about that or speak on it? I might not ask. Free Michael Jackson Bolanos. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to work on this appeal on his own? I would, okay. yeah, I want to help doing that too. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Who were some of your biggest influences as uh, far as, you know, you always want to be in the criminal justice? Man. Like um, Steve Fisher, you know, Otis Culpepper. I know, Otis, yeah. <laughs> um, Honestly, for myself personally, like my biggest influences would be like the the people that I knew when I was in law school, like I had mentors um, and then even the ones that, that I have today, um, Edward Bajoka, when I was in law school, like that was a guy that I interned for. That was the first time I ever really had exposure to um, criminal defense. And that really opened my eyes and made me like super passionate about it. So shout out to Edward Bajoka, um, Mark Hart, Robert Kinney. Steve Lockhart, uh, man, the list, there's such a huge list of people. I know I'm probably forgetting everyone because I'm just doing this off the top of my head. There's like a gazillion people. 
Like there's so many, so many people that have influenced me. Can a judge have an ex parte meeting without notifying the defendant's counsel? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Do you want me to expound yeah, on it? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just like giving you yes or no's. Um, no, nah, you can't do that. Uh, when you're in the middle of a court proceeding, any conversation that happens with a judge has to happen with all parties involved. There can't be anything, otherwise that's like considered like a backdoor deal, right? right. Backdoor dealings, that, that can't happen. Um, in order for things to remain fair and impartial, everyone has to be privy to every conversation that's related to the case. So essentially, if it's ex parte, that we're just assuming that it has relevance to the case, then no. I can't, that's not a thing. Is that a, um, what do you call it, a reason for mistrial? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Have you been keeping up with the Young Thug trial on the lab? So I was keeping up with it a lot before this Michael Jackson Milano's trial, but then that kind of ate up all my time. And mm. So I, I fell off with that a little bit. So, um, but I did hear that that happened in that trial, that there was like some sort of conversation or something like, isn't that why they got a new judge or yes. something like that? Like that judge had to recuse himself. He didn't want to at first. And that's what I was going to ask you, too. Like, why did, the lawyers were filing motions for him to recuse or, you know, get off the bench. But he was hearing his own motions. Like, that always that's happens. That's how it happens? Yeah, that's crazy. I had a trial uh, last summer where at the end of the trial, the judge made an admission that she was actually related to the deceased. And it was a murder trial. Wow. And it took three years to actually come to trial. And at the end of the trial, like she, after the verdict came out, she made this disclosure on the record and I wrote a motion for her to recuse herself and she had to hear the motion and she denied my, she, they, they always go deny it, right? Like what judge is this? To like, you know what? Yeah, I should recuse myself. Like, no, she denied it, but she was after that judge denies it, it's supposed to go like up the chain of command. And uh, she just didn't even send it up the chain of command. She just continued with sentencing and like moved on with everything. And I was like, wow, that's, wow. yeah, yeah. The power of a judge is wild. It is. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with something called the Alfred plea? Where, uh, give an example, like the rapper gunner, they had, it wasn't just a regular plea where you ask them, hey, did you ride with a gun? Did you shoot somebody? They had asked them, hey, is this guy's gang, uh, I mean, is this guy's regular labor really a gang or whatnot? Uh, I, but I actually asked this, is this, is that really telling? Can they use that in court against somebody, a plea deal? No, not really. You're not supposed to be able to use someone's plea against them. Like, unless, well, I guess it depends. So you could, like if this person, so if you got two people that are like testifying, like if one guy is like a co-defendant mm -hmm. or even not a co-defendant, like if he's like, well, I guess he would be, if he would have been a co-defendant, right? He would have been a co-defendant and then like he took some sort of deal like he got some sort of immunity some sort of deal or whatever and then he comes and testifies against the other person yeah i mean i guess as a criminal defense attorney if i'm crossing this guy on the stand i'm gonna be checking for what kind of deal he got i'm gonna be putting that out there in front of the jury like isn't it true that you got such and such a deal for you to come sit here today and give this testimony right yeah so i would i would for sure do that if i'm granted immunity on the state level what's the chances that the feds pick it up and is that just a play to get you to testify and get arrested later? Um, so obviously the jurisdiction between states and feds are completely different. So if you're granted immunity on a state level, that has nothing to do with the feds. The feds could still pick that up. Completely different jurisdictions. Um, is that a play to just get you to do? Yeah, I mean, like, isn't everything a play? Like the reason that they give you deals and they give you immunity and they give you all these things is always for them to get some sort of benefit out of it. So for sure, yeah, that's a play. That's a play. Does felony murder in the state of Michigan still not have a statute, or is it getting one, or where's the process in that? Because it falls under, I know, first degree, first degree premeditated. No, felony murder is more like second degree. So the elements for it are the same as second degree, but felony murder, there just has to be a felony that happens in during the commission of a felony, a murder occurs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's different than first degree premeditated. First degree is completely different. There's It's just a premeditated murder that occurs felony murder means that you're committing some sort of felony and in the commission of that somebody gets killed do you believe it should be a cap on every crime no um no natural life sentences yeah i do i do um 
Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a tough one. Every crime? Like... Well, okay. I get, I get, I get what you Yeah, like, there's some crimes where it's like, depending on the nature of it, like, how egregious are we talking? Like, if we're talking something that's like, like ridiculous, right? Like, someone who's like a serial killer or someone who's like a like this like child pedophile or something like that. Like, I oh, no, dog, you might not need to be out here in these streets. Like <laughs> that might be some like, yeah, you might need that natural. You might need to go sit that one <laughs> on down. Yeah. Like. Well, let me ask this then to piggyback off that question. Okay. If they under the age of, uh, what was it, 18 or 17? 17, yeah. And they commit something crazy. Like you, you, it was one guy, I think it's Michael Gavon. He like killed a family of five at the age of 15, 16 years old, do you believe no matter what the crime is, the juvenile should get a second chance? I, okay, so when you say no matter what the crime, I think that there's facts and circumstances to everything, right? And I think that that should be considered. But at the age of 15 or 16, because you murdered a family of five, like, to me, it doesn't matter if it's a family of five, a family of 10, a family of three, like you're 15 or 16 years old, like, I think you should, there should be a time yeah, you're gonna have to sit that down for a minute you know what i mean but like after that like you definitely should have you should be looked at again and considered to potentially have a second chance i don't think that that i don't think that's just the end all be all for you not at that age that's too young when you get a um, a case you might not be particularly fond of like it might be a pedophile or something like that does it bother you going in to, uh, knowing that you about to defend this guy the best way you can to possibly get him off knowing he probably guilty so here's the thing, uh, because I work for myself, I get to pick and choose my clients, right? So I get to vet my cases. I get to sit down with my client. Well, for the most part, I do do some court appointed work, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I pick and choose, well, well, court appointed, you can't really pick and choose. Like you just get a name and you're like, are you available this date or not? Right. Um, but with that stuff, you know, I'm on like really low level stuff. So it's like CCWs or like, you know, like really basic like drug charges and stuff. But with all of my like capital or my bigger cases, those are all retained, right? Mm -hmm. So I get to uh, I get to sit down with my clients. I get to meet them face to face. I get to listen to what they're talking about. So I get to get a feel for who that person is and whether or not I actually want to represent them. So there has, luckily for me, not been a situation <laughs> thus far in my career where I've had to sit down with a person that's just like wildly crazy and sick to me. And I'm like, oh man, I got to defend <laughs> this person. Like, nah, I don't. Um, all money is not good money to me, so I, I would, you know what I mean? I, I like to be able to pick and choose. So is the court a point work that you guys get? Is it mandated sometimes? No. Oh, I, that's a rumor that you, you guys have to pick up that type of work. Yeah, no, 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 no. You can sign up for the court appointed list if you want, and, you know, you can do it, or you cannot. It's totally up to you. Um, with the Michael Bellano's trial, you was there. What's his name again, Mr. Brown? Brian Brown. Brian Brown. Yeah. How's it work with him? Brian is a fantastic attorney. He's super smart. Uh, he's like a great attorney. He's brilliant. So it was good. What are three things you would like to see change about the justice system? Ooh, whoa, whoa. Only three? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> let's take the whole thing down. Just tear it down and let's build it back up. Build it back up. <laughs> um, three things I would like to change about the justice system. Um, poof. That is such a loaded question. There are so many more than three things. Over prosecution. Um, over prosecution, malicious prosecution. <laughs> Can you explain what over prosecution is? Over prosecution is, um, like a prosecutor that knows that, or a prosecutor assumes you're guilty of crime A, right? Right. But they're going to attach B, C, D, E, F to that just to be like, let's just throw everything at this person and see what happens. And they do that specifically because like when you go to trial, if they're not so sure whether or not you're actually guilty or could be found guilty of crime A, they just want to attach everything to the sun underneath that just to be like, we're going to give a jury something to find you guilty of. Like, that's crazy. Pick the thing you think that this person did and go with that and either they gonna be found guilty of that or not like just right. don't add all these other things in here like i don't to me that's just over prosecution over prosecution is also just prosecuting everybody for everything underneath the sun like there 
there is no, in my opinion, prosecutors these days uh, don't spend enough time, if any, I'm not sure I'm not a prosecutor, but from what I see, and in, in my opinion, they don't take time to really consider the facts and circumstances of each and every case when they're evaluating whether or not to actually proceed with charges. I think that should be something that is a very slowed down process and um, considered a lot more. And when I say slowed down process, I don't mean that like the individual should be sitting in jail waiting for the prosecution for the prosecutor to decide whether or not to issue the charges. I mean, like you gonna know where this person's at. You know what I mean? Like if you're doing your, you're the government, you can always find this person. Like just, but take a little bit more time. Don't just be so frivolous and careless with just tossing out charges like Oprah. Like that's, that's crazy. Um, This is another rumor I I read in the comments that, Judges, lawyers, prosecutors might all have dinner together and they might swap people out say, hey, well, if you get this, my client this plea, I talk him into doing this. I mean, have you ever seen anything going on like that or is that just rumors? I believe that that probably happens. I mean, I myself don't have personal relationships with prosecutors or judges to that level where it benefits me in any kind of way. Uh, like, I, I don't have those relationships, but I have heard more than a few stories that allow me to believe that that for sure probably happens. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. As you've been a lady, um, you know, in the criminal justice system, do you feel like judges might talk to you a different type of way than they talk to a man? Or is it, you know, just pretty much all around the board fairness? Well, there's never all around the board fairness when it comes to being a woman, Um, especially in a game like this. (laughs) But um, I wouldn't specifically say that I guess there are some judges that uh, maybe don't take my arguments as seriously as they do. And I've worked on cases um, with like a male attorney counterpart. Um, and I'm not referring to the Jackson Blanos case with this, but like there, there's actually another case that I'm currently working on. And I think that the judge in that particular case doesn't respect my argument or my opinion as much as my male counterpart, like my co-counsel on this. And it's really weird, but I wouldn't say it happens all the time, but I would say that like it happens sometimes. I would say it's happening on a current case that I'm working on. Okay. I wanted to know, and a lot of people too, if you go to trial, let's say you get a murder case, you go to trial, they offer you 25 years, you go to trial, you get natural life, like, What's the big difference? Like, should it just be a bigger fine or, you know, crime victims fee or something like that? I don't get it. Well, ask the question again. Reframe. So, if I went to trial for murder, oh, excuse me, they offered me 25 years for a murder. Okay. But I go to trial, they give me life. Okay. Like, should it just be a bigger fine or something like that? Like, why, why is it natural life now? Why is it natural life now? Um, when you offered me 25 years. Because you didn't take the offer. That's how offers go, right? <laughs> like they, yeah, like, um, I don't know. Sometimes they think that they're giving good offers. Like, uh, why is it life? Because it's a capital offense, and capital offense carry the potential of life. Um, I don't know, man. I don't agree with the way that prosecutors do anything. I don't agree right. with these offers that they hand out. I don't agree with... I don't agree with the system. I, like again, three things to pick to get rid of the system. That's crazy. Like, no, nah, I just say wipe it clean and let's start again. Start over. Yeah. How could you be found not guilty criminally for something and but civilly? Does that make sense? Yeah, because there's different standards. Um, to be found criminally responsible for something, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Right. A civil standard of things. Uh, completely different because you're just talking about money at that point so you could be found not guilty of some sort of criminal offense and then whomever it is the the victim or whoever might decide that they're going to try to go after you civilly now if you're found not guilty of that the likelihood that their civil suit is going to prosper is lessened i won't say it's impossible but it's significantly lessened because you're biggest defense to your civil suit is like hey man i wasn't even found guilty of this like i was found not guilty of this so how why would i owe you money now right <laughs> like that would be the argument i would make i don't get it yeah. what all services do you offer and like what's your specialty so definitely criminal defense um i do contract work 
I used to do a lot of stuff, but I don't, I don't have time to do all these other things anymore. Even contract work I've kind of slowed down on, but I do have a specific set of clients, I would say, where I still do a bunch of their contracts. Like I write their contracts for them. I review their contracts for them, um, stuff like that. But the, I would say like 99% of my work is criminal defense. I want to go back into that Michael Bernardo's case a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you, was it all fairness from the judge, you, you think, like far as the objections and y'all going through those processes to sustain stuff? No. Not even that, wow. No. Uh, there were several times, in my opinion, there were several times throughout the trial that the prosecution was given several crutches, in my opinion. We would object to something and the judge would um, overrule our objection and allow in certain testimony, certain evidence, um, stuff that was just a thousand percent, in my opinion, objectionable and should not have come in. Uh, and despite that, despite the numerous crutches that the prosecution received, they still weren't able to sustain their burden beyond a reasonable doubt. That's why we ended up where we did. Did the prosecution ever say why they didn't charge the, what was it, the ex-boyfriend or something like that? The one who had the panic attack on? No, they, uh, well, I guess they did in a way. They said they investigated him. And they said that after a thorough investigation of him, that there was not enough to charge him. Now, what do they consider a thorough investigation? I'm not really sure. Because after this man confessed to a murder, uh, then said, oh, my bad, I'm having a panic attack because I smoked some weed, so my bad. I didn't really mean to confess to that murder. Then they were like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense. We're not going <laughs> to, we won't interrogate you. We won't do anything else. Uh, we're just going to, we just going to take your word for it. All right, bro, like, have a good day. So I, I guess they consider that a thorough investigation, though. So I have no idea why, because for Michael Jackson Bolanos, the most thoroughest investigation I've ever seen happened to a single individual on the face of this earth occurred to that man. Like every single footstep he took, every single thing he did was under a microscopic video surveillance. And that never happened to Jeffrey Herbsman. So I'm really, okay. I know it's crazy. I didn't want to laugh like this. No, that's I heard nothing like that. that it is, it's laughable. And they, they literally are standing tall on this. Like, this is what the prosecution is saying. Like, nah, like, he's he's good to go. Wow. Oh, that's wild. I've never heard of anything like that before. Like, neither has pretty much anybody else. So that's crazy. You, you don't have to answer this or whatnot, but I, I got to ask you. Sure. Do you, do you believe if he was uh, African-American, he would have been charged? Jeffrey Herbson? Yeah, Jeffrey Herbson. Yeah, a thousand percent. What do you mean? I don't got to answer that. What? I definitely got to answer that. What? Absolutely. What are you talking about? A thousand percent. If Jeffrey Herzman was black, Michael Jackson Bolanos would have never been picked up, period. That's what my belief is, period. Wow. Yeah, what? Come you see on. a lot of people lie to the police and, you know, they don't go to jail afterwards. Yo, Jeffrey Herbsman lied to the police. According to Jeffrey Herbs, I don't think Jeffrey Herbsman lied to the police. Mm. I think he was telling the truth when he confessed to that murder. But let him tell it. He confessed to a murder. Then he said, oh, my bad. I was lying when I said I confessed to that murder. Well, how come he's not going to prison? Right. Where is his charge at for lying to the police? That That's crazy to me. Oh, okay. We just, we just going to let that one go, though, I guess, right? We're going to pretend like that's not important. Just like we're going to pretend everything else in relation to that man is not important. Right. All right. Okay. I seen. Um. Well, I don't know what to believe on the news or not, but I seen she also had like some stalker ex boyfriends or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. She totally did. She had this other stalker boyfriend, Erin uh, Pergament. Her sister called this guy a stalker. Said that he was obsessed with her. He used to show up to her crib all the time, like unannounced, bringing her gifts. Uh. This guy evidently he also lied to the police. He uh. He was asked whether he had a key to her house and he said he didn't and then text messages later on showed that he did have a key to her house mm. so he lied to the police but where is his charge for lying to the police exactly. man i mean hey i'm just saying this woman had a lot going on she really did she had a lot going on um you know and i'm, I'm not trying to victim shame or anything like that but the reality of it is there was so many possible suspects 
The only one that was like literally not a possible suspect was Michael Jackson Bolanos. That's what made it so mind-bogglingly crazy to me. I'm like, all of these people, we got the list A through Z of all of these people it could be. But how y'all ended up with this man is beyond me. I'm I'm totally unsure how we got here. Was there anybody in forensics that testified? Like, they yeah. explain why it wasn't a bunch of blood matter on them? Like... Well, why there was not a bunch of blood on Michael Jackson Blanos? Exactly. Because he didn't kill her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wait, wait, no, that's facts. I'm just saying, anybody <laughs> take the stand and say that? Like, if he were to, did this this close, he would have had it all over him or what? Um, yeah, I mean, there was, there were several forensics people that testified. Now, the medical examiner for the prosecution testified and said that based on the placement of the wounds that she sustained, and based on the fact that they were minor arteries and not major arteries, that the pressure that would have come out wouldn't have been great enough to have covered someone in blood. Mm -hmm. Um, that's bullshit. <laughs> right. That's bullshit. Because if you look at the if you look at the crime scene photographs and you see the blood everywhere, that in and of itself tells you that the person who murdered her would have been covered in blood. And again, as Brian Brown very cleverly pointed out in closing and several times throughout trial, she was stabbed multiple times in the back of her head. That means that you have to be over on top of the back of her to stab her in the back of your head. Where where do you where is this blood going then? Right. Like that's crazy. Um, I mean, everything about the prosecution's theory is just, it doesn't make any sense, right? Like, this woman was found outside of the crib. I don't know, I'm just going on a tangent now, so you no, stop hey, me. Hey. Like, this woman was found outside of her crib, right? This alarm system, the last motion it had in her house was at 1.24 a.m., right? There's no more motion from 1.24 a.m. until 4.20, which means what? This murder had to have happened before 1.24 a.m. Mm. Interestingly enough, at 1.24 a.m., there's a guy that looks like Jeffrey Herbsman that's running away from the area of the location. Oh, I didn't know that part. Oh, oh. yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's a guy that looks just at that. Did the police investigate that? Did they try to look into any, who that actually was or anything? No, nah, but I was able to find a photograph, like, play that video, play that video, slow it down, pause, 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 pause for like four and a half hours until I found this frame in there and was able to put it next to Jeffrey Herbsman at the Kalamazoo interview, and it looks just like him. That's crazy. But anywho, I digress. So at 4.20, this alarm goes off in the crib, right? Mm -hmm. It's one motion that goes off at 4.20. So that means at 4.20 and 59 seconds, the motion ceases to exist. That's 59 seconds of motion, right? Because then at 4.21 and 4.22... It goes into sleep mode. The ADT system goes into sleep mode, which means it's detecting motion. Motion happens, then it looks for motion. Then at 423, it goes into idle mode. Idle mo mode means there's no more motion. At 423 and 25 seconds, you can see Michael Jackson Bolanos walking up on near the Greektown Casino. But at this point in time, Samantha Wall was already outside of the house because he's already passed Samantha Wall and he's already touched her to see if she was alive. And she wasn't. And then he was like, oh, shit, let me get out of here. Right. So right. he leaves. There's one motion at 420. That's Samantha Wall leaving her house. That's not Michael Jackson Bolanos entering in the house. That's not any sort of interaction between the two of them that occurs inside of the house, because otherwise there would have to be more than one motion because there's two people, which means there has to be two motions. Right. So, yeah. That's how that math would go, because unless this guy comes inside the house, and he, he would have to come inside the house. He would have to tussle with her in the kitchen, through the kitchen, all the way through the house, cause contusions all over her, stab her eight times, and then get out of the house. And then she would have to get out of the house in 59 seconds. But let me tell you why else that's not possible. Because there's a pool of blood in the hallway of the house. For there to be a pool of blood, pool means what? It's accumulated. Accumulated means what? It took time to accumulate, right? Exactly. So that can't happen in 59 seconds if she's found outside. There has to be a period of time for that to accumulate. When does that pool of blood accumulate? Between 1.24 a.m. and 4.20 a.m. That gives a pool of blood time to accumulate. So I don't understand why the prosecution doesn't understand what, how time works. I don't know. Like That's obviously like 
such a sci-fi theory to the prosecution. They're like, time, what is time? I'm like, wow, okay, Socrates. Like, let me tell you what time is. Time is 24 hours in a day. This is how this works. This is how clock works, right? right. They don't seem to get that though. They don't, they don't seem to understand that, that theory. Time is abstract for them. Do you think if like Kim Worthy was in the office around this time, you, you think working with Wayne County would be a little bit better? If she was not in office? Yeah, if she was not in office this upcoming August, if she just stepped down and went ahead and did her own thing. A hundred percent I do. How does somebody like that maintain like that position for so long? Because she's running unopposed. Mm. Nobody wants to run against her. Like I wish somebody would. Right. I will vote for them. Like, where are you? Somebody just come and run against this woman so we can just move on. Like I don't I don't understand. No, nobody wants to run against her, I guess. So she continuously runs unopposed which is why she maintains her position. And I hear she, her conduct is the reason why the integrity unit was installed not long ago or something like that. Oh, yeah. You mean the integrity unit that actually doesn't do anything? Yeah. That's, yeah, I, I guess. Cases. Yeah. yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's why they were put there to, I guess, just make it look like integrity is happening. But I'm yet to see it. So, like, yeah. I don't really know what's happening there. But OK, sure. Heading into a trial like this, I, I guess you got an option between the bench and jury. Oh, yeah. Why would you tell somebody like Michael, yeah, you might want to go with jury? Is it because of odds or? Nine times out of ten, you're going to go with jury. Uh, or at least I would. Mm -hmm. uh, there would have to be very specific circumstances under which I would suggest that somebody take a bench trial. Um, judges are not who I would personally want making a determination on my life. Uh, I mean, if I'm going to trial, like, nah, I, I, no, I would want it. I would want to open it up to people. Let's hear what the people have to say. Let's see what the people think, because people are going to think different ways, right? You get all these different opportunities to even pick different minds. Like you go through voir dire. So you get to see how this person thinks, see how this person thinks, right? You get to, I mean, to a certain degree, of course, like exactly. you're kicking some people off. The prosecution is kicking some people off. But at the end of the day, you're hoping that you're getting some amalgam of enough that's going to be advantageous to you at the end. So I would for sure go jury. And a case of this magnitude and a case with this much, um, what do I, what is the word I want to use to pick my words carefully? Conflict that's like built within the case. For a lack of better terms, everyone knows what I mean by that. I hope so. Uh, we got Michael Jackson Bolanos versus everybody else, right? right. So for, for that um, matter, yeah, no, you, you got to go jury. You got to go jury. You think I would have left this up to like the judge on this? No way. Even with the jury, though, I, I feel like in a lot of instances they get it wrong because the prosecution be so convincing. Why not like a professional jury just people hired to be a jury throughout the whole year or whatever the case might be you know what that's crazy because i've thought about that and was like man i would like if i wasn't a lawyer and like that was a job i would totally be a juror like a professional sure. juror i would just sit around and listen to cases all day and be like yeah all right not guilty or guilty or whatever um but no i don't think that prosecutors are overwhelmingly convincing all the time like yeah there are some that are or there are just some arguments that are convincing more convincing than not right i think that's just kind of like the nature of the beast sometimes but juries do tend to get it wrong but i think it's because um sometimes the way that the law is given to them they don't necessarily understand it very clearly like even taking it back to this michael jackson bolanos case right like this count four that they found him guilty of like concealing facts or misleading the police in regards to a investigation of larcenies for motor vehicles. They found him guilty of that. Like that's not what happened here. Like, I don't think that they even understood what the charge was here. An investigation into from larcenies of motor vehicles. Like there was no investigation that happened about these two bags that he picked up from two different cars. Like where, where were the owners of these cars? 
Where was there any testimony presented during trial that the owners of these cars actually substantiate that this guy went into their car and allegedly took bags out of these cars? Like nobody said any of that, right? That was there was no investigation that was done about these bags being taken from these cars. The entirety of this investigation was the death of Samantha Wall. It had nothing to do with larcenies for motor vehicles. So he did not lie and mislead and conceal anything in regards to an investigation for motor vehicles. So technically speaking, he should be doing zero prison time because that should be not guilty as well. But right. the jury failed to understand what was actually going on there. It's fine. Actually, it's not fine, but you know. Yeah, I go back to the point where they charge you this, 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 and that. And exactly. 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 How is he holding up after this? Do he feel like, hey, at least I'm not doing life? And what's the possibility they might charge him again? Okay, so they've already dis they've already determined that they can't recharge um, based on Supreme Court law, but they want to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court and have the U.S. Supreme Court overturn themselves which is probably not going to happen i don't think at least so that's wild of them um how's he holding up uh, at least he's not doing life yeah i mean definitely he's thinking that he's like wow great i'm not doing life for something i didn't do so that's good i shouldn't be doing sure. life for some shit i didn't do right. so that's positive uh he's definitely happy about that but is he happy that he's doing prison time at all for also, something he didn't do, which was lie or conceal facts to the police regarding an investigation of larcenies for motor vehicles. No, so he's like not happy about that part because that's some bullshit. Am I even allowed to swear on this? Like, am I? Yeah, allowed? I could black it out, or if you don't want to hear yourself cussing and you tell me to black it out, I do it. Oh no, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. Like, I don't know what kind of audience we have here. So. Oh yeah, it's ratchet. Wow. Oh okay, Four great. Girls. Yeah. For well, sure. Just like true crime. Okay. All right. Well then. <laughs> Let's backtrack a little bit. You yeah, said yeah. the Supreme Court ruled that they couldn't, but I thought if it's dead lock, I thought they could retry you again if it wasn't. No. So with these specific charges that he was facing, it precludes them from being able to retry. Reason being, um, he was charged with four things, right? He was charged with felony murder, premeditated murder, home invasion, and then this whole lying to the police about larcenies from motor vehicles thing, right? Right. He was found guilty of count four lying to the police, blah, blah, blah. So let's take that off the table, right? So count one, felony murder, the jury hung. Count three, home invasion, the jury hung, right? Count two, though, premeditated murder, they said not guilty. Inclusive of premeditated murder, there was an underlying that was an, a lesser included of second degree murder. They also found him not guilty of second degree murder, right? So because second degree murder and felony murder have the same elements, they cannot retry on felony murder because that's considered double jeopardy. Because he's already been found not guilty of second degree murder, which means you, you, you don't get a second bite at the apple. Now, following that with the home invasion, when you home invade into someone's house, you got to do it for one of two reasons, either for an assault or for a larceny, right? The prosecution got their pick at the beginning of trial and they decided to pick assault. They were like, he went inside of her home to assault her. First of all, he never went inside any home, but y'all are crazy. Okay, right? That's what the, that's the theory they wanted to go with, that he went inside her home to assault her. It was their pick. That's what they picked. Well, he couldn't have went inside that home to assault her because he was, not found, he was found not guilty of first-degree murder and second-degree murder. So that means no assault happened, right? Because right. in order, like, if someone's getting murdered, there's an assault. They found that not guilty. So under the home invasion theory that they chose, that has that assault, now they can't read. Now they can't retry on the home invasion either because you guys chose assault. You didn't choose larceny. So you don't get another bite at the apple. You don't get to change it now and be like, oh, well, we're gonna go for lar. No, 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 no. You can't do that. It's over. It's a wrap. You chose what you chose. You got what you got. That's your bad. Have, oh, have you seen anything like I'm talking about in Michigan? Period. That was crazy as this. Now, I mean, not on no. TV, not in Cali, but just in Michigan. No, nobody has. Man, like this case received like worldwide attention for how like not even just nationwide, worldwide attention. That's how crazy this case was. Like this was like spoken about all over the world. Like Brian Brown was receiving phone calls from like here, there, and everywhere about this case. Like crazy amount of attention. 
This is just something ridiculously unheard of. Probably will never happen again. Yeah, the chances of all this happening in that night. But like I told you, I've never seen somebody go from breaking in cars to killing in home invasion. I've just never seen that transition. And I've been because it doesn't that. happen. <laughs> like, because it literally doesn't happen. Like, this is crazy. The amount of things that occurred through the entirety of this trial, fr from the way that they charged this, the theory that they had, the timeline they used, their use of attorney-client phone calls, like, they entered those into evidence. Phone calls between Jackson Bolanos and Brian Brown were entered into evidence by the prosecution, and they tried to, like, piecemeal it, like, do bits and pieces. Like, that's crazy. Attorney-client privilege just doesn't exist anymore. The judge, we, we filed motions for this, and the judge made a ruling and was like, no, nah, it's coming in. That's wow. wild. Attorney-client calls coming into a trial and being played for a jury? Like, that is crazy. That's crazy. But, yeah, they were able to get away with stuff like that. And even with getting away with stuff like that, they still couldn't meet their burden. They tried everything. Like, that's the most underhanded thing to try to use calls between an attorney and a client. Like, that is so privileged. And that privilege is, like, literally... The found is is part of our core foundation of our of our judicial system, right? Like that is such a coveted thing right there. And for you to exploit it like that and then play it for the jury, and then they thought they was gonna play slick, right? They tried to like play a couple seconds of it, like a minute or two of that call. I was like, no, nah, because I listened to that call, right? I listened to that call in its entirety. I, I called Brian. I was like, bro, you gotta play the whole call. Mm -hmm. I was like, the whole thing. Like the rule of completeness. Like if they're gonna play a portion of it, like let them do that. But when we come back around, we're playing the entire call because that entire call is like a closing argument in and of itself. Like that call was Jackson Bolanos being like, dog, like I did not do this. These people are crazy. Like, why are they saying this? Blah, 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 blah. Like it was an entire like 16 minute call between him and Brian Brown that we played for the jury. Like crazy. It was beautiful. I was like, the prosecution is so stupid. Like these guys just tried to play a couple minutes of it thinking they were slick. Like, oh, y'all must have forgot that the rule of completeness exists. Like, uh. Yo, bad. Wow. So basically, you guys gotta stop telling, or yeah, stop telling people. To maybe just talk to an attorney over the phone because if it's gonna be allowed. Either. Man, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, first of all, um, and generally speaking, like we, as attorneys, like we, even though we talk to our clients on the phone, like we'll always tell them, like, don't talk about the case on the phone. Sure. And they actually like the thing is the conversation that Brian Brown and Jackson Blanos were having over the phone was actually not like intricate detailed information about this case they, it wasn't like strategic detail that was being discussed it was literally what had just previously happened at the preliminary exam like just a couple hours earlier they were just rehashing what already occurred but the problem with that is like it's really unfortunate man like you have this white prosecutor right and like i, I don't care people are going to be like oh man everyone makes things like race-based i don't care some things just have to be race-based and that's just what it is you have a white prosecutor overhearing a conversation between two black men right and the way that they talk with one another and the lingo that they're using and what they're discussing this guy can't even understand what's going on exactly. so he thinks he's hearing things and he thinks he's like you know, some private investigator like Columbo, like putting together like facts, right? But the reality is this guy doesn't even understand what the fuck he's listening to. Like he has no idea conceptualizing nothing of what's happening here because he doesn't understand what, he, first of all, he has no basis as to what the hell this conversation is. Secondly, he clearly does not understand what is being discussed here. Like, because Jackson Bolanos is like, man, like, uh, why was that judge saying like like the judge was talking about some like I would run up on her and like run her pockets, bro? Like I ain't even no type of weird ass nigga like that. Like I wouldn't even do that. Like bro, I would not. I would never run nobody pockets. And Brian Brown is like, yeah, bro. Like we already know. Like you you seen her, you touched her. That's how the blood got on you. Blah 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 blah. And Brian had already said this at preliminary exam, so this was no surprise. He had literally made this argument a couple hours before, and him and Jackson Bolanos were talking about this on the phone. And this guy's like listening to this conversation and he's like jackson bolanos is denying coming across the body like he's clearly he's being fed this story about touching the body from brian brown like bro do, do you even understand how it is like can you do you not understand two black men speaking to one another like uh, where are you confused because i'm listening to this same conversation and i'm clearly following what's going on here but this guy was lost in the game had no idea crazy
listening to you talk though, speaking on that dialect, you you hip about everything. Where does that come from? Being raised in the city, like the friends that I've had, like the communities I've been in, like you know what I mean. Like it's just that's what it is. You're pretty diverse. I see. Yeah. Um, being a lawyer, do you develop criminal thinking to an extent? <laughs> no, I don't think you do. I mean, like criminal thinking. I. I mean, I guess you're thinking about a lot of criminal things all the time. Like you're you're thinking about other people's criminal activity, right, all the time. But that doesn't necessarily make me like. I definitely don't want to go do criminal activity. Shit, I see too much of jail and I see too much of jail and prison as it is. I'm like, I could never go there. Like that's some shit I'm not gonna do. Like I don't I don't already tried that before. Like been to jail before, but like I'm not going back. So criminal thinking. And it's not necessarily about wanting to do you. You might walk past a bank and be like, damn, if I was my client, uh, Michael, I would have robbed the bank like this. I did a little different from him. Yeah, let's not use the name Michael, though. Let's use <laughs> Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. No. Um, yeah. Let's use the name, like. Yeah, we go with Edward. So. Yeah, boom. Okay, let's go with that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, my boy Edward would probably do this like this. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe. Like, that might be some stuff that, like, unbeknownst to me, like, you know, happens, like, subconsciously. Like, I'm not even thinking about it, but it probably, yeah, it probably happens. You not a hustler, you can't get in front of you just can't flip it. You ain't really got it, you P. Diddy, you be remixing. Oh, worry, just got a new Glock, <laughs> that's a free biscuit. Penny Tupac know what's up, we know on the mill